Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to see you. Would you stand and join us for our first song? Amen, amen. 
Island. If you would, turn and greet someone before you have a seat this morning. What a great day to be together. Welcome, welcome, welcome to worship. We are glad you're here. Welcome to those that are joining us online too. What a great day it is to worship the Lord together. And I'm glad you are here. We had a lot going on, a lot of things kicking up with school going back. And we're praying for teachers and we're praying for teachers and we're praying for teachers. And, and it's all the parents sing Hallelujah Chorus, right? And uh, all those things. Praying for the students as well. We'll have a great year as they come back in. If you will, turn your attention to our screens. Check out some of the announcements we have this morning. Hello, I'm Janine. This is what you need to know. It's back. Tuesday with Jay has resumed and continues weekly at 7 a.m. in the Curry. You can participate online or in person. An email invitation is sent out weekly so you can enjoy devotion and discussion and great coffee. Speaking of emails, we are grateful to have seen many new faces over the summer months. If you are not getting our weekly church emails for the church at large and kids ministry, please contact us to be added to the list so you can stay in the loop. We are excited for various study opportunities this fall, starting Sunday, August 14th in room 202 with our parent devotion group. Meets weekly at 1015, led by Andrea Heath. It's a great way to connect with other parents while your kids are with us in Sunday Jam. They will be digging in to the Beatitudes. Also coming up Tuesday, September 6th, when changing nothing changes everything, the power of reframing your life. This ladies group is led by Aviva Goldman Rice and Connie Walker, and they meet on Google Me Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. This will be going on for eight weeks, and all ladies are welcome to join and can sign up on our website to participate. Another ladies study group this fall is returning with Women of the Word, led by me, Janine Blakeborough, on Friday mornings from 9.30 to 11.30. We start September 9th and childcare is provided. We'll be starting off with Not Alone, a study on friendship. If you are interested, please email me at family at rhumc.com to participate. Studies are a great way to connect and plug in, and so is joining our chancel choir. Practices are Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and there's room for you to join this awesome group. Email music at rhumc.com with any questions or feel free to drop into the music room Wednesday nights. It's that time of year again when we need to update our church records for check-in. Did you know we have a church center app where you can check in on your phone? Head to rhumc.com for the link to do this or the QR reader right there in your bulletin. Kids will still need to be checked into kids worship or nursery for name tag and safety purposes. We do ask for parents to go to the app and make sure your information is correct, especially for kids' new grades and other details. You can also upload your own profile picture and update those to help us connect better with you. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. Whew, that's a lot, isn't it? I feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. It's good stuff. Well, there, there's even more in the bulletin, too, because there's, there's another Bible study, midweek Bible study, that I'm going to begin on August the 31st, and it is open to men and women. So it's a co-ed group. We'll have two sections of it. We'll have a 10.30 in the morning, and we'll have a 6 p.m. in the evening. So if you can hit one of those, uh, just email me. The information's in your bulletin. You can uh, shoot me a note so we know who to plan for and who to get books for and all that sort of stuff, too. Lots happening in the life of our church. Whew. And we have to pray God guides us every step of the way. We have um, many prayer concerns. Uh, those are also, we keep a list of, of names of people that have requested to be in our prayer, uh, for our prayer team and for us as a church. We have those listed in your bulletin as well. And I want to remind you, um, we've had a couple that had experienced loss this week. Uh, uh, Anna Gregory lost her father, uh, Barry Gregory, um, this past week. And um, uh, Gary Peterson lost his brother very unexpectedly in West Virginia. Um, was out cutting the grass and collapsed and, uh, and passed away. And so uh, Gary and Terry are up in West Virginia uh, seeing about their uh, services there. So remember them and their time of need and time of loss. And uh, as I mentioned before, we do want to remember all those back to school and back to work and back to whatever we're doing. Uh, praying God will guide us every step of the way. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll close this prayer inviting our offering to be received as well. So we'll pray over that too. Father God, we just love you and praise you, and, and we gather here today in your name to worship you and to praise you. We pour out our hearts to you, asking 
for your comfort and your peace to those in need around us, especially our, our family and friends that are close by. Lord, we know there are so many other things that distract us, that bring us down, that bring depression upon us. And we ask for your freedom to come into our hearts, that you will release us from, from depression, from addiction, from negative feelings and thoughts. Lord, we pray that you will fill us with joy and hope, that you will surround us with a protective hedge to guard us against the evil forces of this world. And Father, we pray that we will be a light to all in need, that we can be your hands and feet, that we will celebrate our salvation with you each day. Father, come and, and, and fill us, fill this space with your presence today. May we know you very close by. And we pray, O oh God, that you will use these gifts of our tithes and our offerings, of the time we spend here, our talents, our worship, our service. Lord, that you will use them for your kingdom and your purpose, that we may draw close to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, if you'll come. Stand and join us as we continue in worship. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. I am not kept it to lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand Power that can say, power in your name. 
be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pour your spirit out. What a great word for us today in asking God to pour his spirit out on us afresh today. Man, it's a good looking group today. Turn the lights on. There's a good many of y'all here. And I can hear you singing too. So if you're here for the first time, it was your voice that made all the difference in the world. Thank you for participating. And uh, it is great to be together, as I've said a number of times. Today, uh, actually, Kathy and I are starting a, a short series, and today is part one of, of a two-part sermon, and uh, we're going to kick it off today. Um, how many of y'all enjoy going to the doctor? You just love going to see the doctor? Well, you are a doctor, so... You... <laughs> and I love doctors, I just don't like going and visiting them. <laughs> you know how it is. You enjoy getting poked and prodded and them telling you breathe and breathe and you hyperventilate and they say, what's wrong? You lose your breath. You're out of shape. And you're, no, you just told me. <gasps> and so I'm doing this and, you know, shining lights in your eyes and tapping things and hitting you with little hammers and all that. It's really fun. I like going to the doctor so much. I schedule mine every four or five years. <laughs> Spread it out. Spread it out. And no, actually I do. I, it's been four or five years since I've seen one, but I have gone to one recently and I've uh, got my checkup and all that. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I, I do enjoy, I like doctors. I like Adam a lot. And um, he's not my doctor, so I really like him. But um, I, did, I don't like getting checkups. And maybe it's because I'm always afraid they're going to figure some, find something out that I didn't know. And that's why we, we, we're reluctant. We, we don't like doing that. Um, but check, checkups are good. They give us a baseline of our health. And many times they find things that alert us to some terrible thing that may or may not happen if we don't address it. If we leave it unaddressed, it could really, really harm us or be something much bigger than we thought. Um, many of us, though, we would rather stick our head in the sand and ignore uh, as long as we possibly can. Um, we, we think, if I just, if I ignore it, it'll go away. I'll get over it. I'll heal. Especially men. We're really bad about this. And um, instead of addressing it and all that. You know, the church is really bad about ignoring trouble too. Uh, we're, we're bad about paying attention to, the, to our own health as a church. And, and so many times we are long overdue for a church checkup. And that's, it's time for a church checkup today. And as we, we start this today, I want to I tell you, here's the big idea. The big, the big deal is this. Healthy churches can't exist without healthy Christians. You hear that? Healthy churches can't exist without healthy Christians. We need to be healthy in our own faith journey as well if we're going to have a healthy church and be able to be about the business that God has called us to be. So while we may be talking about the church in general and talking about a building or, or maybe this particular one in this checkup, we're really talking about the Christians that make up the church because that's where our health is. If we got gripes or complaints about our church or what's, you know, the church or whatever, we have to pay attention to realize that our, our health of our church is dependent on us as healthy Christians. So this kind of comes about. So some of us are aware of issues that, uh, in the church that, uh, that maybe others aren't. So I'm not pointing at any figures at anybody today, but I am talking about us taking inventory of ourselves this morning as we begin. Now, I'll be the first to admit... And my doctor will tell you, Jay, your BMI is a little high. You know what a BMI is? Your body mass index. And he says, it should be this amount. And I'm like, look, if, if I was that, do you know how frail I would be? I couldn't throw my weight around like I do now? That's funny. That's really funny. So I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of a fat Christian, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So look with me today. Our text today is actually over this week and next week. It's from 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. And today we're just going to focus on verse 8 because it's going to be the meat of the subject today. And it reads this way. It says, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and humble. Now this little list is a checklist for us to walk through for church health, a list of what the church needs in order to be healthy. Now, Peter begins this passage, this, this verse here, it's in, in verse 3, he begins it with the word finally, which means you're thinking he's going to wrap up his letter 
here, but he doesn't. He goes on for several more chapters, kind of like us preachers. So this letter is, is one of his circulation letters, which meant that he, it was to be passed along from one church to the next. In a lot of places he had been, he'd write it to one, they would read it to the congregation there in somebody's house, and they would take it in, they would study it, they tried to understand it, then they would take it on to another church. It would be passed along. If you looked all the way back at the first chapter in 1 Peter, Chapter 1, he, he says he addresses this letter to all God's elect, all of you who have come to faith in Christ Jesus. This is written to you. And he, and he goes on to say all over the world, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and everywhere in between. Everywhere this, this letter was being shared, this is to you. So he makes it clear that this letter is for all of you. And he says it in verse 8. He says, finally... All of you. Now, who does that include? All of us, right? So this letter is really written to us as the body of Christ, as the church. Now, now we cannot say this checkup is for those who are sick or for those churches that are fighting or those that are all getting along. This is for all of us. It's for everyone in between. It's not just for the ones having problems. Now, the first thing Peter says that we need in order to be a healthy church is to live in harmony. He uses the word uh, like-minded. And uh, so we need to be unified in our mind. And, I've, and I'm thinking, oh man, right out of the chute, we see trouble, don't we? How many of us all think alike? Yeah, not very many of us. We have a hard time agreeing on where to eat this lunch after church. It's hard enough. And there's an old saying that where there are four Methodists, there are five opinions. And I could say that about Baptists, about Pentecostals, about <laughs> Lutherans, Catholics. Where you get four people together, there are going to be five different opinions. And that's just the way we are. Our minds don't necessarily always jive together. But that doesn't mean we can't be like-minded. Now hear me, we don't have to agree on everything, but where we can have the same common purpose. Being of the same mind is difficult, but it's not impossible. And it's what, what God calls us to do, to be of like mind. If we're going to be a healthy, if we're going to be healthy Christians, we need to find harmony of mind. Now, how do you do that? How do you how do you do that in this self-indulgent world that we live in? Well, if I go back to my doctor's analogy, my doctor and I have one thing in common for sure, and it's to make sure that my body is healthy, that we catch anything that's wrong. That is our goal. That is our mission, is we want to determine what is the best way to live healthy together. Now, we may disagree on everything else, but if we have that same common thought, then we are on the same page. We are in harmony together. Now, how do we do this as a body of Christ? How do we move in this direction? Well, it starts with what we fill our minds with. It, it starts with what goes in, because what goes in is what comes out. Matthew tells us that. He says, from the outpouring of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you put into your heart is what comes out. And some of you, be honest, you get up in the middle of the night, you stub that little baby toe against something, first thing that pops out of your mouth isn't praise you, Lord, is it? <laughs> now, sometimes I use the word sweet Jesus, and it's probably not a praise name. It's more in vain. And I'm like, Lord, I'm going to bite my tongue off if I'm not careful. But that's what we do. We have to fill our hearts with what goes, what we want to come out. We fill it with those good things. You ask any pro athlete and they will tell you that what you feed your body is actually more important than how you train. You won't find a pro athlete that eats Twinkies and Ho-Hos and drinks a lot of alcohol and smokes a lot of drugs and all that stuff, and is able to perform at peak performance. They can't do it, because what goes in, your body cannot use that as fuel. And it's the same, thing, same way spiritually. What we put in to our body spiritually, into our minds and into our hearts, is what fuels us to be able to live a Christ-like life, and where we can be a healthy believer. Now, Acts 2, verse 42, says this, now, this is the early church. Remember, Pentecost happened. Peter preaches. A bunch of people come to Christ, and they're gathering in houses. And it says this is what they did, those first believers. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then verse 44 says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They were sharing the thoughts and the, the motivation and the mission of the kingdom of God because they were coming together. And it's fascinating to me because verse 42 is so great. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay, they gather for worship. They gather for, for, for study and those things. But then some things that a lot of us do, we fellowship really good. 
We're good at fellowship, aren't we? And breaking bread, woo, let's eat, right? We eat good, we fellowship good, we do those things well. We just got to get the bracket ends. We need the, the apostles' teaching on one end and the prayer on the other. And let's bring that in so it will help our minds be of one accord. Now, they, these folks, these early Christians, they prioritized learning God's word together, spending time together to worship and eating together, to praying together. There was a lot of togetherness. We used to call that, when, when I was growing up, we didn't have bucket seats and captain's chairs and minivans. We had sedans with a bench. And you could always tell, when we got the new car that had the fold-down armrest in the front, that meant all four kids were in the back on that long bench. And that was what my parents called togetherness. And we, we got along, sort of. For most of the ride, anyway. It was good. Togetherness. So you see this. Our minds become unified and in harmony when we pursue God together. Our life is together. That's where we find unity. We're going to build on that some more. If we're filling our minds and our hearts with the things of God, we will live a healthy, harmonious Christian life with our other brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean we're not ever going to have problems, not ever going to have disagreements, but that's what happens when family gets together, right? We get together and we have a common thought. The next thing Peter points out is that a healthy church needs Christians with understanding spirits. The word in our verse is sympathetic. Um, and and who, needs, who needs to do this? Is it just you touchy-feely people? Is it just you folks that like, oh, like to hug and pat and hold hands and all that stuff and want to say all and all? No, it's actually all of us. Remember, Peter said, all of you do these things. All of you be sympathetic. Well, what in the world does that mean? Sympathy means that we feel with depth for someone else. We have a deep compassion or, or sympathy for someone else. We feel deeply for our, our loved ones, our close friends, our children. We, we, that comes easily. But the bigger step is now you turn that compassion, that sympathy to others in the body of Christ. And you can say, well, Jay, I don't even like everybody here. Okay, that's all right, but we can turn toward them and start offering some sort of sympathy toward them. Many times it comes when we get to know them better, when we spend time with them. We get to know them better, and we find out their life, and they find out ours, and we find out that we have a mutual um, agreement about things. When we open up to a new person, when we, we begin to share life, that's when we start feeling sympathetic, and we start understanding each other better. Romans 12, 15 says this. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So we start there. I want to rejoice with you and you're rejoicing. We see that at the, at the, in the spring of every year, graduation. We're like, woo, I celebrate with you that are graduating your seniors. You know, I celebrate with you when you have a wedding in your family. I celebrate with you with birthdays. I want to rejoice when you're rejoicing. And then when there's loss, we mourn with those who mourn. I can't understand how, how bad it must be to lose a loved one. And we understand mourning the loss together. So we learn to reach out and have sympathy for those. That's where connection happens in the life changes we are in. So when you are, you know, when you are at your favorite football team's game and they do something really great, you will turn and you will high five perfect strangers all around you, won't you? Because you have this common thing. It's like, woo, and you're great, man. You may even hug them. And you don't even know who they are. They just happen to sit near you. Same thing as when they lose a game. When they, when they don't do well, you have this shared experience. You sympathize with each other. And you may even put your arm around their neck or, or pat them on the back and go, hey, we'll get them next time. There's this shared experience and you're sympathizing. Why can't we do that in church? Why can't we share those experiences together? That's what the body of Christ is about is, hey, let me walk with you on this life road through the highs, through the lows, through the joys, and through the sorrows. We can do this together. It's not hard to do. We just have a hard time doing it in church for some reason. And Paul says we need to do that. If we're going to be a healthy church, we've got to become healthier, and we've got to do this. Because here's the deal. Romans 12, 5 reminds us, it says, So in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. 
We say that at baptisms that we are part of the family of God and we belong to each other. We need to be watching out for each other. I'm not talking about spying on each other. I'm talking about watching out for each other. Because you know where you stumble, somebody else stumbles too. Where you have victory, somebody else can have victory too. And we want to reach out to them and help out the best we can. John Maxwell says, he, has a, he is full of great quotes, great leadership quotes, but I love this one. It says, everybody that belongs to the body of Christ belongs to everybody who belongs to the body of Christ. So we belong to each other. You're my brothers and sisters. We are family, and we belong to each other. I owe it to you to reach out to you and to, to listen to you, and you do as, me as well. And that means that we are family. We are family. Does family always get along? Negative. They do not. But healthy churches need unified minds. We need an understanding, sympathetic spirit. And we also need unconditional love. That's the third one. The unconditional love is what we need. Peter said, all of you love one another. Jesus said that too. But the word in this verse for love, the Greek word is phileo. And you Pittsburgh people know of a town called Philadelphia. No, Philadelphia is where? Wrong side of the state. Oh, <laughs> not brotherly love. And so, so it's not brotherly love. It is a city of brotherly love. That's what phileo means, is brotherly love. And it's uh, probably the worst example I could ever give you would be Philadelphia. But... It's where we get the name, and it's brotherly love. It's like family. This is, this is not some fl fluffy, sentimental kind of love. Um, listen, I am the third of four kids in my family. I was in the middle of the back seat. You know what I'm talking about? Me and my younger sister, because they had to have the older ones by the doors. I don't know why. But, you know, there were times that we would not get along. We would argue, and we would tattle, and we would scratch and bite and say mean, mean things to each other. And you would think these kids don't know Jesus and they certainly don't love each other because of the way we treat each other. But when all the dust settled, you better believe we loved each other. We'd go to the mat for each other because we're family. And by golly, you better not say anything bad about my brothers and sisters because we were going to go at it because we're family. Family loves each other. We may not always act that way, but we love each other. Sometimes we disagree, sometimes we argue, but our love is deeper than the argument. And that's the way the body of Christ has to be. We have to love beyond the argument and say, you know what? You are made in the image of God just like me. And I love you because of that. And that's tough sometimes. First John 4, 7, and 8. He used to sing a little song with this verse. But it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. But look at this. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. If you don't love, you don't even know God. And that's an important thing to do. Healthy Christians love with the love of God and in turn make the church healthy. We have to love beyond our, our preferences in our lives. And that means we need to have unselfish hearts. That's the fourth thing today. Unselfish hearts. The NIV translates this compassionate or a tender heart. It is not, you know, in our base human nature to be compassionate. It's just not the way we are because we're selfish. We don't want to have compassion on the people. We see the homeless person on the street, they're dirty and they're unkept, and we try not to make eye contact with them. And they're trying to make eye contact with you because they know if they do, it's like a window into your heart or something, isn't it? It's like all of a sudden they pull on those strings and you go, oh, and you start reaching in your pocket and you start pulling out money or something like that. But you think, gosh, if I can avoid eye contact, I'll put on my sunglasses. I'll roll the window up at the, you know, there at the stop and I'll look ahead and I'll turn the music up and I'm like, I'm looking at my phone sort of because I'm really hoping the light will change green quick so I can move on. Because we know that if we break that plane where we, we actually make eye contact with another human being that's asking for something Compassion wants to come out. It wants to come out. And he's like, we have got to have a tender heart toward folks. And now, you know, we do this in church too. We come in with all kind of masks and guises up. We want people to think we got our stuff together. You know, we come in with smiles and a happy good morning and we're all excited and we're happy. And um, we're just trying to cover the fact we had World War III in the car on the way to church. 
We just had a big fight. Maybe before he left the house. No, put your shoes back on. I don't know what you did. We were running late again. We'll just tell him we got caught by the train. Yeah. I know it's a real deal. But it doesn't come through every three minutes. We struggle with vulnerability. Exposing our own hearts. And we think that if we make eye contact, if I let you in, then you're going to see all my flaws and all my, all my wrong and all the things where I fall down. But being vulnerable and what you do with it are very important. Someone may need to be vulnerable with you and it's just wanting you to listen. They want you to just see them, to be there with them. But our natural tendency is to be selfish, so we clam up and we shut people down. We put, keep people out of our heart. Folks, that is just not healthy at all. You may not want to engage because you think, well, I don't have anything to offer. I can't help them in any way. I can't fix their problem. That's okay. Sometimes that's not what they, they're asking for. Sometimes they just want to be seen. I'm alive. I'm here. Will you acknowledge me? Sometimes people need you to see them and maybe, or maybe you are the one that needs to be seen, to be acknowledged. That you are struggling and someone else knows and, and they're willing to walk along with you just to be a companion in life. Not to fix you, but just to be there. That's compassion. Let me just be with you. And maybe they, they may even ask you, what do I need to do? And you may go, I don't know. But you know what? I'm going to be here with you. Every step of the way. Every prayer. And I'll remember you. Matthew 9, verse 34 to 36 says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Now that's a lot. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And look at this. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We need unselfish, compassionate hearts because we can't have a sensitive heart if we have a selfish heart. It's hard to, to reach out to someone else when we're always looking in. We're always worried about our own condition. But I will tell you, and you may know this too, when you offer a hand of support, often you feel strengthened more than you ever imagined. It's crazy. When we give, we receive so much else in return. It fills us and it encourages us and empowers us if we would just offer a hand when giving a church health check, you know, it is easy to look at the church and say, yeah, the church needs to do better at, at having one mind and understanding sympathetic spirit. And it needs to do better with unconditional love and compassion, and unselfish hearts. It's easy to point fingers at the church. But folks, as I mentioned when we started, Jesus also said it. He said, you are the church. So self-evaluation today is how are you doing? How is your mind being set in Christ so that we can be of one mind? How are you showing and living out sympathy toward others? How are you loving your brothers and sisters? How are you being unselfish with your words and with your time? God has a lot to offer us. And just like going to the doctor, sometimes we don't like hearing the results. But now you hear this little snippet, and like I said, part two is next week. Is this little snippet just says, hey, how am I doing? Am I spending my time dedicating myself to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, to prayer? Is that where I'm finding the common things that I need for the body of Christ? And folks, we've got a strong church. This is a great place to worship, a great place to be a uh, part of the kingdom building. But we can be even better. We can be even stronger. And that all is up to you of how healthy do you want to be in the body of Christ.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you call on us each day to come and spend time with you, just to fellowship with you, to be in your presence. And Father, you fill us every day with the power and the strength to take steps of that faithfulness. So Lord, today, as we, as he, we hear these words of, of encouragement, as we hear the report from the doctor, maybe we need to ask, Lord, what do I do? What do I need to do to be strengthened for your kingdom? Father, meet me right where I am. Help me have the courage to be vulnerable where I need to be vulnerable, to be compassionate where I need to be compassionate, to love where I've withheld it, and Lord, to, to get into your word so I can think straight and live in harmony with my brothers and sisters. Father, meet me right now, right where I am. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand and join us for our closing song?
Hallelujah. You have been set free. So take that. You got a good doctor's checkup today. He's saying keep up the good work. Just eat more greens and fruits and vegetables and do a little exercise. You know what I'm saying? Let's fine tune this family of faith and go and do the work of the kingdom. Go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.